The Spanish Armada was anchored off Gravelines in the summer of 1588. Their ships, though battered and holed, and their crews blooded and shaken, were still a formidable fighting force. King Philip's enterprise of England was still on, and the threat of a Catholic invasion was still to be feared by Queen Elizabeth and her people. The Spanish ships lay snug at anchor. Guard boats were out and sentries posted. As soon as daylight appeared, the Armada's commander, the Duke of Medina Sedona, would receive news of the Duke of Parma's army. The army of Flanders, the most powerful and feared fighting force in the world, was so close to them. All the Spanish needed was a few hours' grace away from the long-range cannon of the English. It seemed the Spanish had done it. They were so close. Suddenly a cry went up, then another, and another. The night sky flared in angry flames of red and orange. Roaring beasts of fire and flame were bearing down on the tightly packed Spanish ships. Ships that were held together by wood, tar, canvas, and packed with gunpowder. If those flaming ships reached them, it would be death. The terrifying truth was plain for every Spaniard to see. Hell was coming for them. Or perhaps, hell burners were coming for them. The fire ships sent by the English to scatter the Spanish Armada were not technically hell burners, but the Spanish believed them to be. Fire ships packed with gunpowder, with fuses timed to explode at a precise time. The Spanish cut their anchor cables and fled. The Armada was scattered, and the rest, as they say, is history. But why would the Spanish think the fire ships sent by the English would explode when they were in the middle of the tightly packed fleet? To answer that, we must go back a mere three years to Antwerp. In the bitterly cold months of 1585, the Eighty Years' War was still raging in the Netherlands. The grand city of Antwerp was besieged by the Spanish under Alexander Farnese, Duke of Parma. Parma was an innovative commander and had posted a bridge of ships over the River Scheldt between the sea and Antwerp. This blockade was to starve the city into submission. For the city to continue fighting, it was vital that the bridge was either captured or destroyed. But destroying it would be no small feat of arms, as this description suggests. Starting from Fort St Mary, this barricade was formed by a large, solid tree trunk, deeply driven into the riverbed or into the sandbar, spaced three feet apart from each other in width and four feet in length. These tree trunks were planted as close to the middle of the shelter as possible, out to a distance of 450 feet the point where the depth of the riverbed no longer allowed piles to be driven. This formidable matrix of piles was joined together by heavy wooden beams, well nailed and immobilised by chains, which gave the entire structure an unfailing rigidity and stability. On this foundation was laid a pathway, made of heavy wooden planks and beams, which formed the bridge itself, and which was protected on both sides, on the Antwerpian side and on the Zeelander side, by a musket-ball-proof parapet made of wood and packed with clay. Between the fort of St Mary and the centre of the bridge, but closer to the fort than to the middle of the river on each side, Farnese had 12 equally massive piles driven into the riverbed, securely chained and connected by heavy beams. These piles advanced a few metres into the Scheldt, beyond the main line of the barricade, so as to form a kind of ravelin with parapet. On this ravelin, which projected out from the barricade, the prince installed a battery of three demi-cannons for the defence of the bulwark against an attack by enemy ships and stationed 50 soldiers there. A little bit beyond each side of the bridge along its length, between the fort of St Mary and the end of the ravelin, were additional piles driven into the sandbar, slightly exceeding the water level of the river and interconnected by heavy beams, which in this way constituted a sturdy stop barrier for enemy ships or machines which would come up against the barricade. Starting at Fort St Philip, a barricade constructed exactly like the one which we just described, extended out from the side towards the middle of the river for a distance of 950 feet. Between the two parts of the bridge, which were thus advancing to meet one another, a large space of about 1,000 paces had remained open where the depth and flow of the Scheldt did not allow tree trunks or piles to be driven into the riverbed. Farnese had 32 large barks, which had been brought from Ghent by way of the Steken Canal, placed side by side, one next to the other. At the bow and the stern, these boats were each immobilised with two anchors, 
chained one to the other. Each boat was equipped with two pieces of artillery. There was a distance of about 10 feet between them, but they were held in place and in line by a solid chain which ran from one to the other and connected them all together, and by way of a deck that covered all of them. In order to defend the approaches of the entire bridge, the Duke had put just beyond, approximately within reach of a line, both on the Antwerpian side and on the Zeelander side, a row of 33 boats arranged in groups of three. The three boats of each group were joined together by strong pieces of wood, and upon the boats were lying, pointed in the direction of the enemy, and securely fastened, the ship's masts, which had been fetched from Denmark and the Scandinavian countries. Each of these masts was fitted at the tip with a large iron point, in the form of a lance, and was to be used to keep at some distance the boats, the ships, and the machines that the enemy would probably not fail to send towards the barricade, with the intention of destroying it. The soldiers called these two barriers, which resembled rafts, the floaters. To complete this defence system, 20 vessels were stationed near the Flemish riverbank, and 20 near the Brabantian riverbank, ready to intervene at any moment. The entire span of this gigantic structure was no less than 2,400 feet in length from one bank to the other. So how to destroy this barricade? An army could not get near due to the strength of Farnese's force, and the soldiers inside the city were too weak. The man who came up with the idea of destroying the Spanish contraption had originally offered his services to the Spanish king. The man was called Federigo Giambelli. He was an experienced military engineer who had served in Italy and had offered to work for Philip II. The Spanish court must have turned him down resoundedly as he straight away travelled to England and once more offered to work for a crown. This time, Queen Elizabeth I, who was unofficially assisting the Protestant rebels in their fight against the Catholic Spanish. He was soon advising the Queen and her council on how to liberate Antwerp. The original plan was to use three medium-sized merchantmen, the Orange, the Post and the Golden Lou. But this was turned down and only two smaller vessels were made available, the Fortune and the Hope, both of about 70 tonnes. These two ships were to be converted into floating bombs, or infernal machines, or hell burners, or Antwerp fire. They could perhaps be called the world's first weapon of mass destruction. But despite how potentially destructive and terrible this new devilish weapon might be, the ingenuity of it was way ahead of its time. The fuse in the Hope consisted of a combined clockwork and flintlock mechanism provided by an Antwerp watchmaker, Bori. The Fortune instead used a delayed fuse mechanism. But the ships were not going to be just floated downstream packed with gunpowder. These two ships were to be the biggest dirty bombs ever seen. The ships were indeed packed with gunpowder. To get maximum effect, very large charges were used. To intensify and channel the explosion, an oblong fire chamber was placed in each ship. One metre in diameter, the bay was fitted with a brick floor, one foot thick and five metres wide. The walls of the chamber were one and a half metres thick. The roof consisted of old tombstones, stacked vertically and sealed with lead. The chambers, with a length of 12 metres, were each filled with a charge of about 3,200 kilograms of high-quality corned gunpowder. On top of the chambers, a mixture of rocks and iron shards, scrap metal and other objects were placed, again covered in slabs and tombstones. The spaces next to the chambers were likewise filled. The whole contraption was covered with a conventional wooden deck. On the night of the 4th of April, 1585, Jambelli put his fiery plan into action. As well as the two floating bombs, he and the Dutch Vice Admiral Jakobsen set 32 extra fire ships down towards the bridge of boats. As this flaming fleet drifted through the night, the decks were stacked with wood and slow fuses. As expected, it didn't all go to plan. Brave men piloted the floating bombs, until the last minute they escaped in skiffs. The fortune ran aground, but at last a slow match on the deck burned out, and there was a partial explosion, but little or no damage was done. The Spanish troops, crowding on the palisade, gazing over the parapets, started to laugh. What were the Dutch thinking, threatening the greatest army in the world with these sparkly toys? The hope, however, 
continued on its murderous way. It eventually nudged into the bridge of boats that was encircling Antwerp. The cataclysmic explosion tore the night apart. 800 Spaniards were killed in a flash. The sconce called the Santa Maria was wrecked from stem to stern. The Duke of Parma himself was wounded by flying debris. He was hurled to the ground, stunned by a blow on the shoulder from a flying stake. The page who was behind him, carrying his helmet, fell dead without a wound, killed by the concussion of the air. The explosion was said to have been heard 50 miles away. The river Scheldt surged and flooded dikes, and debris rained down for miles. It was very likely that this was the largest man-made explosion in history up to this point. The hope had disappeared along with the men who had boarded her. The bridge, the men on sentry there, and the blockhouse were all a charred hole in the night. Reports of houses being blown over were received, along with tales of the air being filled with ploughshares, gravestones and marble balls intermixed with the heads, limbs and bodies of what had once been human beings. Slabs of granite, vomited by the flaming ship, were found afterwards at a league's distance and buried deep in the earth. Nearly a thousand soldiers were destroyed in a second, many of them being torn to shreds beyond even the semblance of humanity. A Spanish officer called Richborg was found two days later, wrapped by an iron chain which had once held bridging boats together on the river. A Portuguese officer of high rank was also found, his body mangled and intertwined by bridge timbers. But despite the huge explosion, the damage and the casualties inflicted upon the Spanish, the damage was quickly put right. The Dutch didn't capitalise on the success, as they believed the attack had not been successful. The bridge was soon repaired and the blockade continued. The Dutch attempted more attacks, which the Duke of Parma countered, especially at the Battle of Cowenstein. Antwerp was eventually to fall to the Spanish, even though the Dutch now maintained their own blockade, bottling up the Scheldt from Spanish trade coming in or out of Antwerp. So were the Hellburners a failure? At Antwerp? Yes. But in the Spanish mines? No. The fire ship sent by Lord Howard and the English fleet against the Spanish Armada would reap the benefits of the Antwerp Hellburners, the Spanish believed the fireships to be hellburners because they knew that Jambelli was in England working for Queen Elizabeth. Yet the fireships drifting down towards the anchored Spanish were nowhere near as deadly as the Antwerp bombs. For the main reason, the English had pretty much emptied their powder stores in the running battles up the channel, and Elizabeth was extremely reluctant to send any more. So the English would certainly not have had enough spare powder to pack into seven or eight warships and use them as a huge bomb. But the reputation of the Antwerp Hellburners had done its work. The Spanish believe a weapon of mass destruction was heading straight towards their packed anchorage, and so they cut their cables and fled into the North Sea. England was spared, and Jambelli himself was in fact working on constructing a boom from ship's masts, costing £2,000 to block the Thames against an invasion. To see how that worked, or didn't, click here. We hope you enjoyed this look on the A-bomb of the Tudor Age. To look at our amazing facts on the Spanish Armada, part 4 coming soon, click here or follow the link in the description box below. Thanks for watching.